Welcome to the Map the System Canada online final event. My name is Latasha Kafrobe and I am the current program manager for Map the System Canada. I will be one of your co-hosts today. We're excited to share this event with you, um, celebrating the remarkable work of Canadian students this year. Welcome to all of you, students, educators, judges, and fans. While we are unable to gather in person, the Map the System Canada final event gathers us all here today to celebrate the hard work and research that our Canadian students have done this year. We have guests tuning in from across the country, so I encourage you um, to drop in the chat box where you are tuning in from. A few things to go over before we get started. Because we are using Zoom webinar today, there is no need for attendees to have their camera on. We also encourage you to use the chat box. A member of our organizing team will be monitoring the chat box throughout today's events. We especially support you sharing words of encouragement to competing teams in the chat box today throughout the, present, throughout the team presentations. Today's event will be recorded and will be available on our Map the System Canada YouTube channel early next week. So please cozy up, grab a drink and some snacks and get ready for a remarkable amount of presentations today. Before we get too far ahead of ourselves, I would like to acknowledge the land and traditional territories in which we e-meet today. At the Institute for Community Prosperity, reconciliation is an active movement for us. And while we are unable to gather in person, we take every opportunity to acknowledge the land and peoples that make it possible for all of us to gather and prosper today. The Institute for Community Prosperity is situated within the traditional territories of the Siksigate Tikiti and within the Treaty 7 region. We recognize that viewers are tuning in from across the country. Um, prior to European settlement, this land that we all reside in um, was fully inhabited by Indigenous people. There are over three, 634 First Nations who live in what is now known as Canada. This land, um, on this land, there is also over 70 distinct indig Indigenous languages that are spoken. Indigenous people continue to be the original caretakers of this land, and it is to them we owe thanks for this opportunity to live in such a great nation. As part of reconciliation, we acknowledge our duty to strive for the truth and to work with First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people of Canada in a consensual, reciprocal, and respectful way to build a prosperous future for everyone. If you don't know the traditional or treaty lands that you reside on, we encourage you to do some research um, and we will be dropping a really helpful link in the chat box in just a moment. So let's get started. Today I am joined by my colleagues James Stotch and Amy Rintoul from the Institute for Community Prosperity. We will be your virtual hosts. Behind the scenes we also have Colson who will be monitoring the chat box and offering tech support to all presenters. The Institute has been organizing the Canadian edition of Map the System since 2018, and we are thrilled to host you today. I will now hand the mic over to James um, to provide an overview of Map the System. Thank you, Latasha. For anyone who's new to Map the System, it is a global initiative created by the Skoll Centre for Social Entrepreneurship at the University of Oxford. This competition was created to encourage a learning first, problem-based approach to social change one where students take the time to understand and build upon existing efforts before attempting something new. Students and recent graduates are challenged with understanding a problem and its wider context. Rather than jumping straight into a business plan or a hackathon pitch competition or design sprint that creates a new solution or re rewards a quick fix, participants dig into the factors influencing and underlying the challenge, the landscape of current solutions, and the missing opportunities, what we call gaps and leverage points for positive change. We have students not just from business schools, but also from the arts, sciences, and a wide range of professional faculties. Students are here competing from diploma programs in community colleges and polytechnics, to liberal arts undergraduate schools, to graduate students at research intensive universities. And they all bring unique and valuable capacities, mindsets, knowledge, and experience. We hear a lot about 21st century skills, communication, creativity, collaboration, empathy, information and data literacy. 
Map the system is beautifully positioned to help develop and showcase all these skill sets. Across the globe, there are 50 participating post-secondary institutions and over 20, 220 participating student teams in Map the System 2021. Peter Drobeck is the director of the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship at Oxford. A global health and inf infectious diseases expert, you may recognize Peter as a frequent commentator on CNN and the BBC speaking to the COVID-19 pandemic. He sends his well wishes today to participating students in this video message. Greetings from Oxford. I'm Peter Drobak, Director of the School Center for Social Entrepreneurship. And on behalf of the School Center, Said Business School, and University of Oxford, welcome to the Canadian final of Map the System 2021. I want to congratulate everyone who participated this year, and especially the 16 teams who have reached the Canadian final for your extraordinary hard work under obviously very challenging circumstances. This has been a year for Math the System like no other, and the fact that you've all come this far is an extraordinary testament to your passion, to your hard work, and to your, to your commitment to the social and environmental issues that brought you to Math the System in the first place. Now, Map the System is all about equipping ourselves with the problem-solving tools and leadership skills to engage with wicked problems. And wicked problems are all around us. Everything from the pandemic to the scourge of systemic racism to the climate crisis, big global issues, but then also really sticky issues closer to home in each one of our communities. You probably hear all the time that you're the leaders of tomorrow. I say, we can't wait for tomorrow. You're the leaders of today. So thank you for stepping up and doing your part to build the kind of world that we all want to live in. I want to take a moment to thank our partners at Mount Royal University, at McConnell and Recode, at Trico, uh, and of course all of the educators across Canada uh, who have really made all of this possible and shown great vision and leadership. We couldn't do this without you. Uh, it's going to be a really exciting event today. We're excited to tune in from across the pond, even though it'll be pretty late for us. Uh, I want to wish the best of luck to all eight finals who are going to be competing uh, in the Canadian finals today. And of course, we'll look forward to hosting the four finalists at the global final um, uh, here in Oxford virtually in June. And I do want to encourage all of you to mark your calendars uh, for the global final because we're doing something different this year. Of course, we can't have everyone to Oxford as we love to do and usually look forward to every year. But because we're forced to do this virtually, we're going to blow the doors open and try to make this as exciting and engaging as possible to you and to participants around the world. So in addition to the global final, Final, we're going to be running something that entire week called Systems Week. So the competition will be bookended each day uh, by some extraordinary sessions of academics, practitioners, and other change makers looking at systemic issues from healthcare to climate change to inequality, really thinking about what it takes to create deep systemic change. It's going to be an awesome learning experience. It's going to be a really fun convening, and I hope you can all take part. More on that soon. For now, let's celebrate uh, the eight finalist teams uh, and we'll be cheering for you to everyone gathered today to watch this. Um, it's not as easy to bring energy online, so you're just gonna have to cheer that much more visually and that much more loudly. Have a great day and good luck, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Map the System was brought to Canada in 2016 when the McConnell Foundation Recode Initiative partnered with the Trico Charitable Foundation and the School Center to support building this Canadian level of competition. This partnership grew because of the strong alignment of the values in systems education, social change, and leadership development. Canada is the only country in the world to host a nationwide final, and Canadian student teams have consistently risen to the challenge with a strong showing at the global level, including finishing first in three of the past four global competitions. The success of these teams on the global stage is a reflection of the remarkable education and support students receive from their campus educators and institutions throughout the country. It is with the continuous support of our partner organizations, including the financial and non-financial support of the McConnell and Trico Foundations, that the Institute for Community Prosperity is able to continue hosting Map the System Canada. Now over to Kelly Hodgins of the McConnell Foundation to say a few words. Hi, everyone.
everyone. Um, thank you again. Uh, thanks, James. Um, I'll make my remarks very short. Um, as, as James said, uh, McConnell is a foundation working to improve social and environmental outcomes across Canada. And my work there, along with a couple of my colleagues, is focused on the post-secondary sector and how we can and drive social and environmental impacts through the different assets and capacities of universities and colleges, but particularly the people that move through them. So when we heard about Map the System out of the University of Oxford back in 2016, we wondered about the value in maybe nurturing something like that here in Canada, as James mentioned. So the first year we tried that, it was a great success and it's really only gotten better from there. And I just really need to highlight though that the reason it's gotten better is because we entered into this partnership with Mount Royal University, who really stepped up to take over the running of the competition. Um, and as each of you probably has experienced the support from, from their team. I just, I owe such a debt of gratitude to Tash and James and Amy and Coulson, um, the team there. Each year they're really adapting the program to become better, to become stronger, always in line with the changing needs across Canada, trying to just make this competition the best and the most relevant experience for students. Um, so, and then really, I mean, at the heart of it all, it's, it's you, it's the students who make it so wonderful year over year and the educators who support them. This competition is really animated by you, by your feedback and your work and your passion. And really it's just, it's such an achievement to be at this stage today. Um, and it's really, really energizing for, and exciting for me and my colleague Andrea, who's also on the call, to see the commitment that you have to these topics. And so just really congratulations, we're, we're excited. Thank you, Kelly. And I apologize if you hear sirens in the background. <laughs> this year, uh, 16 post-secondary institutions from across Canada participated in MAPTA system. Each year we see more and more schools becoming involved as well as those already participating, deepening their involvement through course-based or co-curricular programming. At each institution, there are also a number of dedicated educators, faculty members, staff, and or former students, as well as their supporting departments who help bring this competition to life. This is multiple months of commitment and no small undertaking from advertising the program and recruiting students to recruiting and prepping judges, hosting campus level finals, and of course, coaching and mentoring teams. Across these 16 Canadian institutions, there were 111 Canadian student teams who participated in this year's Map the System. While this number is down from previous years, it is still remarkable that 300 plus students had the passion and tenacity to complete their research, systems maps and presentations in what we know is one of the most stressful and anxious years in modern history to be a student and undoubtedly the most challenging to collaborate as a team. Each team has spent countless hours researching, writing, conducting interviews, and of course, visualizing systems. This year, teams were also faced with the additional challenge of navigating a global pandemic. So congratulations to you all. In April, participating institutions hosted their own campus final events, during which they chose their top team to represent their university or college at the national level. Throughout this past week, all the Canadian finalist teams have been engaged in a number of activities, including uh, sorry, all 16 teams, uh, including coaching sessions on Monday and Tuesday, a student social event, and the semi-final semi event that took place on Wednesday. All 16 teams presented before a panel of judges in that semi-final, and after careful consideration, reviewing their um, detailed submissions, the judges chose the top eight teams to advance to today's Canadian final. Today we'll, we, we will be reviewing um, we will be reviewing the presentations from these top Canadian teams, and the event will close with the announcement of this year's Map the System Canada winning teams. So, out of the eight, four teams will be selected today to go on to represent their institutions and Canada in the Map the System Global Final, hosted by Oxford in June. Equally critical to supporting this competition are, of course, the judges. And I'd like to first acknowledge the many judges who supported the competition at those local campus levels. Thank you for your time and expertise in supporting the students across the country in their journey to this national stage. 
and I'll now briefly introduce our national judges panel. This year we have a remarkable cohort of judges from across Canada. Dr. Nino Antadze is an assistant professor of environmental studies at the University of Prince Edward Island. Jody Callahu Stonehouse is Cree and Mohawk from Michelle First Nation and is the executive director of the Yellowhead, Yellowhead Indigenous Education Foundation. Alexia McKinnon, a citizen of the Champaign and Asiac First Nation, is the director of Indigenous Business Programs at the BD School of Business, Simon Fraser University. Anna Johnson is the Network Engagement Manager at Ashoka Canada. JP Bergowitz is the Chief Strategy Officer for Community Foundations of Canada. Violin de Rosier is the head of the Canadian Red Cross in Syria. Monique Fry from the Cheem and Seychelt First Nations is also Vice President of Community Success at Helpseeker. And Deirdre Evans is a business faculty member at Nova Scotia Community College. Our thanks and gratitude goes, goes out to these judges who've spent so many hours reading submissions, watching online presentations, and contributing their own reflections and thoughtful suggestions to the teams. I'll now hand it back to Tash to go over the evaluation process. Thank you, James. The presentations that you will be seeing today are only one component of the competition. In fact, the majority of the work that teams do go into the creation of a visual systems map, a 3000 word research analysis, and a detailed bibliography. Each of the written submission materials are evaluated on, on the following criteria, an application of a systems thinking approach, understanding of the challenge landscape, an understanding of existing solution, solution efforts, identification of gaps and leverages of change, and key insights and lessons learned. Each team has spent countless hours researching, conducting interviews, and mapping systems over the past four months. The systems map, research analysis, and bibliography account for 70% of the team's final score. Like James had mentioned earlier, the judges have been busy this week evaluating the written submission materials of every team. If you are in, um, during today's event, the teams will be presenting live their 10 minute presentations. This is the last component that teams are, are to prepare as part of Map the System. The presentation is a part of the competition that most mimics a business pitch competition. In the 10 minute presentation, teams are required to demonstrate their understanding of a broader system in which their challenge exists. What are the root causes of the problem? And what might be the elements necessary for transformation? Participants are not asked to provide a solution, but rather to highlight an understanding of the current state of their challenge. In their presentation, teams should be able to articulate the new perspective that systems thinking brings to their complex challenge, highlight any assumptions, systemic patterns, connections, gaps, and potential leverages of change that the system analysis has surfaced. It's no easy task, and so you are in for a, a great list of presentations today. So some of you might be wondering, what are teams competing for? Teams that are presenting today are competing for the opportunity to represent Canada and their institutions in the global Map the System final hosted by Oxford University. Today, the judges will be selecting four winning teams. Along with becoming a global finalist, the top four teams today will be rewarded with a $2,000 cash prize per team. There will also be an opportunity for you, the audience, to select two audience choice winners today. The audience choice winners from room A and room B will be given a $250 Canada Helps gift card to donate to a Canadian charity of their choice. Details about the audience choice voting process will be provided later on. Now let's meet the finalist teams. For today's final, teams have been divided into two rooms. In room A, the following teams will be presenting Mount Royal University, the University of British Columbia, Wilford Laurier University, and Humber College. In room B, we will have Trent University, the University of Sherbrooke, Albert University of Alberta, and the University of Waterloo. If you haven't had a chance to choose which room you would like to view, please take a quick look at the teams that, we that will be presenting in each room. The presentations will take approximately 60 minutes. Following the presentations, all guests will return back here into room A 
for a keynote presentation by Daniela Pappy Thornton. The judges will deliberate in a private Zoom room and will, will announce, the, announce the winners following the keynote presentation today. Don't forget to take note of your favorite presentation um, so that you can cast your vote during the audience choice. If you wish to attend the presentations in room A, please stay here. There is no, there is no necessary actions. We will get started in a few moments. For anyone who wishes to attend the presentations in room B, you can find the link in the you can find the link in the itinerary that was emailed to all attendees earlier today. We have also dropped it in the chat box for you. Oh, sorry, we'll drop it in the chat box in one minute here. In room B, James Stotch and Amy Rintel will be awaiting guests and the presentations will start in just a minute. So please take a moment to enter into the room that you would like to view the presentations. To enter into room B, you must completely exit this Zoom webinar um, and use the link provided in the chat box. Thank you. Colson, next slide, please. For those of you who are sticking in room A, we will get started with the presentations in just a moment as we will give everybody the opportunity to transfer to room B who would wish to do so. Welcome to room A. All of the teams are queued and ready to go. The order of presentations in room A will be as follows. Mount Royal University, followed by the University of British Columbia, followed by Wilfrid Laurier University, and last but definitely not least, Humber College. Teams will have exactly 10 minutes to deliver their presentations. Following their presentation, a judge may ask one follow-up question of the team. In the room, in room A, the judges joining us today are JP, Violin, Alexia, and Nino. To the audience, again, don't forget to make note of what, of what submit, of what presentation you enjoyed the most today. We will have an online poll following the following the presentations. With that, I will call on Mount Royal University to please bring up their presentation. Hi everyone. Our presentation is on the overrepresentation of Indigenous children in the Canadian child welfare system. Before we begin our presentation, we would like to take this time to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot First Nation tribes of Sisica, the Bikani, the Guyanai, the Stony Nakota First Nation tribes of Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley, and the Sitna First Nation. The city of Calgary is also homeland to the historic Northwest Métis and to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. For non-Indigenous students who will never have to experience systemic racism that Indigenous peoples do. However, we recognize that educating oneself and spreading awareness is a key step in being an ally. We recognize that each community will have different lived experiences and cultural traditions. But to get a wider understanding, we focused on the general patterns across Canada. Think back to when you were a child. Did you ever go on a surprise road trip and were so excited because you knew you were going to have the time of your life? But what if instead of your parents in the front seats, it's strangers and you never come back home? They drive you hours away but won't tell you anything and you're so terrified you throw up. They, you meet your foster parents, but they're not the parents you love and so desperately miss. You're trapped in the skin that everyone hates. So you lash out at those white skin monsters just like daddy taught you, but somehow it's you that ends up broken. A piece of you will always be missing and for the rest of your life, you'll be trying to find it. But your past, language, and culture feel worlds away. You'll be lucky if you ever find your way back home. Indigenous overrepresentation in care is tied to settler colonialism, which aims to disconnect Indigenous people from their land, culture, and autonomy through assimilation and genocide. 
The disruption of Indigenous families started with the Oppressive Indian Act of 1876, which gave the Canadian government full control over First Nations. The Indian Act was the first piece of legislation to propose education as a tool for assimilation through the forceful removal of Indigenous children to attend abusive residential schools. In the 40s, residential schools transitioned into operating like orphanages and child welfare programs after the Canadian government acknowledged that expensive residential schools failed to achieve the genocidal results desired. Closure of residential schools began between the 60s and 70s and Indigenous children were removed from their families by child welfare agencies into non-Indigenous homes contributing to cultural genocide. These events have increased the number of Indigenous children in care today. Chronic government underfunding and ongoing effects of colonialism have resulted in Indigenous children constituting 52% of children in care, despite only making up 7.7% .7 of the Canadian child population. The aim to kill the Indian in the child contributed to language and culture loss. Many Indigenous children suffer from various types of abuse that bring families ties for generations to come. The 60s scoop continued to remove the children from communities and into the welfare agencies, repeating the same trauma. This led to substance abuse and mental illness that affect the ability to parent. The effect of colonialism is still much active to this day in the form of Eurocentric parental skill assessments and theories that don't fit into Indigenous families. Government imposed rules and restrictions, lack of access to technology, low literacy rates and language barriers make accessing services nearly impossible. This discrimination against Indigenous peoples makes them less likely to trust services that aren't accommodating their cultural needs. Unaddressed physical and mental health issues in parents makes it harder for them to take care of their children, increasing the likelihood of child apprehension. Barriers in accessing services due to lack of support for an Indigenous parent played a role in the disappearance of Bonnie Joseph. After her children were apprehended, she was working hard to get them back. To attend court days and child welfare appointments, she had to hitchhike as a car was a luxury for her. One day though, she never made it to her appointment nor came back home since. Cultural disconnection occurs when non-Indigenous foster families do not incorporate the child's culture as a regular part of their life. Another major contributor is the pan-Indigenous approach in which we fail to recognize important difference among Indigenous communities. Indigenous peoples feel disconnected from their land and language, which affects their sense of identity. Cultural preservation is pivotal to decolonization. Social work professor Audrey Fogin suggests that connection to the land enables regaining confidence in their Indigenous self. Despite adversities experienced due to their Indigenous identities, understanding one's culture can invite them to forgive themselves, which acts as a healing process. In From the Ashes, Thistle describes his experience as a Métis youth avoiding his own culture in order to get along with his non-Indigenous peers, as he told them he was not into that Indian shit and made fun of his brother for learning about their backgrounds. This is an example of how colonialism works on an individual level. The different facets of racism are embedded within each other and interactively reinforces the social inequality experienced by Indigenous people. The structural racism reinforces the relationship between child welfare and other institutions to drive the overrepresentation of Indigenous children in care. Government underfunding has led to inhumane living conditions such as housing issues, the water crisis, and poverty on reserves. COVID-19 enhances these poor conditions and contributes to culture loss due to the susceptibility of elders to the virus. Despite parents' lack of control over their living conditions, their kids are taken away because westernized assessment tools qualify poor socioeconomic conditions as neglect. The not in my backyard phenomenon prevents Indigenous peoples from residing in certain communities by perpetuating a culture of racial exclusion and increasing rent prices driving frequent moves. Housing discrimination in urban areas limits housing options, resulting in a higher rate of Indigenous people residing in over crowded and rundown housing. Children can then be apprehended for poor living conditions and housing insecurity. Employment discrimination and limited educational opportunities can cause the apprehension of children based on low socioeconomic status. Indigenous communities are policed more aggressively compared to other communities, increasing the likelihood of Indigenous parents being racially profiled by police officers when they respond to child maltreatment reports. The child welfare system interacts with discriminatory health services by apprehending children on the assumption that parents are neglecting their child's health. For example, birth alerts disproportionately impact Indigenous women by alerting child welfare that a child might be at risk for harm upon giving birth. 
parents are not informed and do not have the power to influence this decision. Pollution landscape. The Australian-based risk assessment and safety planning tool, Signs of Safety, is used in Alberta. The beauty of this is its strengths-based approach. However, it is in accordance with pan-indigeneity. BC 92 recognizes Indigenous self-governance, though a lack of funding prevents Indigenous authorities to have full control. UNDRIP recognizes Indigenous people's human rights. Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission recommends implementing it for reconciliation. Bill C-15 is derived from UNDRIP and it is still subject to the colonial legislative process and provinces and territories are not bound to the bill. Jordan's principles ensures First Nation children's access to services. However, a lack of funding is obvious, which Bill C-92 fails to address. Jordan's principle originated from a tragic incident of a boy, Jordan River Anderson. He was born with multiple disabilities and stayed in hospital his whole life, despite the doctor's permission to go back home. If only the government held accountability to financially support his medical care needed at home, Jordan and his family might have been able to happily go back home together. Inadequate funding of infrastructure can be resolved through funding based on community need and updated policies involving the maintenance and operation of new technology. Collaboration with knowledge keepers is needed to prioritize cultural preservation and child welfare, welfare legislation and social work practices. Addressing the lack of support for Indigenous jurisdiction over child and family services requires long-term funding through quick negotiations. Addressing the lack of Indigenous education and data requires involving knowledge keepers in the development of curriculum and Indigenous Services Canada research must be recent for informed decisions on community development. Addressing structural racism requires positive media representation of Indigenous peoples, Indigenous focused education from K to 12 in universities and workplaces, inclusion of Indigenous oversight bodies in all institutions, Indigenous oversight and representation in law enforcement, as well as collaboration among Indigenous and Canadian settlers for Indigenous rights and self-government. Why are Indigenous peoples seen as the only ones who need to heal if our colonial racist nation is the cause of the poverty, intergenerational trauma, and discrimination that Indigenous peoples experience? We must collaborate with Indigenous peoples in decolonizing Canada to ensure we stop racist practices and actually listen to their needs. So unlearn those colonial biases, confront racism when you see it, and encourage the Canadian government to let all Indigenous children grow up in their culture, just like you got to. Because every child has a spirit, and that spirit longs to go home. On behalf of my team, I'd like to thank all of our interviewees for sharing their knowledge with us. And we would also like to thank you for listening to us. And we ask that you please check out our resource document that we will link in the chat to learn more about Indigenous issues. Thanks. Thank you, Mount Royal University. Such an excellent presentation. I will now hand the floor to the judges. Um, if there is any judge that would like to ask a question of the team. Go ahead, Alexia. Hi, Latasha. Hi, Mount Royal. Excellent presentation. Thank you. The question that I have is, was there anything within the system landscaping that surprised you? And if so, what was it? And how has that knowledge impacted you? And how might it result in what you do moving forward? Um, I can start. Um, so one thing that was really surprising was um, child welfare assessment tools and how Eurocentric they, am, they are and how a lot of the knowledge in universities and in curriculums is rooted in Western knowledge and that can really harm people of different cultures when you are assessing them. And that was really eye-opening because I do want to become a psychologist and a lot of the assessments we do use um, are take a universal approach and they don't really account for different types of cultural experiences and I'm hoping that in the future I'll be able to do more research on the validity of assessment tools um, and multicultural psychology so yeah. 
for me, it was the fact that the child welfare it was is a um, billion dollar industry. And this is something that I hadn't known before the research into map the system and I think it's impacting society um, so much because the government and no none of the governments want to be responsible for the child who needs the help who needs to be loved um, but we need to know that those children do deserve love just like I did um, too so um, I hope that someone can, including us, learning about it is, of course, one of the steps into the journey, um, being responsible for what's happening. So uh, instead of saying, it's not my fault, it's not known my business, um, we got to stand up and say, hey, that's our issue too. Um, so that's my learning. Um, for me, I think what most impacted me or what surprised me the most was looking at the effects of COVID-19, because obviously that is like absolutely traumatic for just about any of us right now, but it is a lot more hard hitting for people in from collectivist cultures uh, because the they rely on their community for support. And of course we do too, but it's not to the extent that they do regarding cultural celebrations and such. Um, so the isolation, from everyone else is incredibly, like I, I can't even begin to imagine how people, indigenous peoples must feel having to completely adapt, like adapt to everything right now. So, um, and in the future, I do plan on working with social innovation somehow. And um, really this project has just made me a lot more mindful of what Indigenous peoples go through and the racism they endure. Um, so hopefully I can work more with them and learn more about the culture in the future. Sorry, just really quickly for me it was there were several things that, sur that surprised me. The first one really was how much um, the community different indigenous communities were over policed. Um, my research led me to go through different refor reforms that step that went all the way from the 90s or actually 1989, I think, was when it was first um, introduced and it was implemented in 1991. It was, there were so many promises that the government made and yet 30 years on, a research was made a year ago how none of those were honored. None of the um, reforms that promised Indigenous that there would be more Indigenous police officers, none of that was honored. And there was a lack of you know, recognizing the Indigenous um, police officers as legitimate. So that surprised me very well, much. And lastly was the birth alerts that I actually just heard about it, this like this um, project. And, um, you know, it just, the, la the fact is that the government's trying to, or it says that they're trying to help by giving us all of this Bill C, Bill 15, Bill C-15, Bill C-92, and then they give us birth alerts. So it's almost as if they're just like giving us services, but then they're also giving us barriers at the same time to try and change the, the whole system. Thank you to the Mount Royal University team. Again, an outstanding presentation. Um, I will now call that we have reached the end of our question period. Um, I will now call on the University of British Columbia team to please bring up their slides, Anika, Kathy, and Emily. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep, whenever you guys are ready to get started, go ahead. Perfect. Hello everyone, my name is Kathy and I am here with my colleagues, Annika and Emily. We are nutrition students from UBC and today we will be exploring urban indigenous food insecurity in our home, British Columbia. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that our research was conducted in accordance with UBC at the Point Grey campus which is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam Nation. Thank you. First, we would like to begin by addressing household food insecurity in British Columbia, which is at a rate of 12.4%. 
This is equivalent to over half a million individuals in BC living in food insecure households. In addition, BC has the second highest Indigenous population in all of Canada, and in Vancouver alone, there are over 61,000 urban Indigenous peoples, with the majority being First Nations. It is important to recognize that the monolithic term Indigenous peoples encompasses First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples who can come from various locations and backgrounds. One in three BC food insecure households identify as Indigenous as Indigenous households experience one of the highest rates of food insecurity compared to other ethnicities. And finally, the consequences of food insecurity can include an increased risk for poor health outcomes, which can include diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. Our challenge was exploring why Indigenous peoples in urban areas, particularly in BC, are being disproportionately affected by food insecurity, and why many of the current systems in place are ineffectively addressing this issue. To gain a better understanding of the current context of food insecurity for urban Indigenous peoples, we collaborated with UGTS, an Indigenous-led nonprofit organization in our community. With COVID-19 exacerbating access to food, UGTS created their Essential Food Basket program to support over 700 households throughout BC's Lower Mainland. With UGTS, we surveyed about 20 users of this program on the level of household food insecurity they were currently experiencing and the barriers they may be facing in accessing sufficient food. In addition, we interviewed individuals in the community who have experience working with Indigenous-led organizations and communities and conducted a literature review. From our systems map, we found that urban Indigenous food insecurity is being held in place by complex interactions between many sectors, including government, economic, and environmental. We have also identified six key stakeholders impacting urban Indigenous people's food security and we'll explore how these complex relationships between them have influenced access to both sufficient and culturally appropriate food for this population. Looking at the root causes, this issue has mainly stemmed from ineffective governmental policies, environmental barriers that can limit access to food, and the social and indigenous determinants of health being inadequately addressed. There is currently no food security policy at the federal or provincial level, and current policies that are attempting to address upstream factors are often rooted with a colonial perspective and are overall ineffective in improving access to food. Particularly within an urban setting, increases in basic living expenses, the pressure to balance westernized ways of living with traditional food practices such as trading food, and distance that can reduce opportunities to learn traditional knowledge and skills can impact an Indigenous person's food security and limit their access to traditional foods. We are also aware that individuals may be more accustomed to the urban environment or have other cultural preferences. The Indigenous determinants of health are not being adequately addressed, which consequently can limit one's access to food. The impacts on distal and intermediate determinants of health, especially the presence of systemic racism, has influenced the proximal determinants of health for Indigenous peoples, notably in education, employment, and income. Despite equal education levels, Indigenous peoples are less likely to be hired compared to their non-Indigenous counterparts. For those who are employed, they face disparities in hourly wage, making an average of $2.50 less than their non-Indigenous counterparts. Indigenous peoples are also overrepresented in the lowest income group, making less than $21,600. These discrepancies can lead to challenges in being able to afford adequate food and increase one's risk of being food insecure. When we looked at what perpetuated food insecurity for this population, we found that systemic racism was prevalent in many underlying layers in place, including harmful perspectives and power imbalances that over time have contributed to this issue becoming so prevalent today. Additionally, food banks continue to be Canada's primary initiative in tackling food insecurity, despite countless research evidence concluding that they do not address the issue. Recent statistics found that only a quarter of food insecure individuals use food banks, making it clear that food bank use is the exception and not the norm. Food banks continue to perpetuate the problem of food insecurity by giving the illusion that an existing initiative is addressing the issue. Aniga, I can't hear you. Do you mind repeating that? Can 
do you want to try your sound ag again? Don't worry, I paused your timer here. So sorry for the technical difficulties. No, we can't hear you, Annika. Yeah, no worries. Um, okay. hold on. Um, if she comes back and her audio doesn't work again, we can continue on and I can say her part. Sorry about that. No apologies needed. Yeah, we'll wait a, a few, a little bit here and see if Annika is able to come back. And the joys of presenting over Zoom. <laughs> Thank you to our audience. Uh, we, we will keep moving with the presentation in just a moment. Um. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Oh, and are you back with us? Yes. I don't know why it switched to my phone audio in the middle of the presentation. Sorry, I can, can I continue? Yep, I will start the time. I paused it when there was some tech issues. So go ahead team, um, feel free to go back to the previous slide and keep going. Okay. <laughs> now we'll move on to the solutions landscape, which range from a variety of sectors and levels of government. And we recognize that while some of these initiatives that we've listed here work within our colonial structures, these initiatives have been evaluated on its impact on addressing food insecurity. Through analyzing solutions, we recognize that some initiatives were more effective than others, and effective initiatives benefited and addressed the aspirations of the specific community they were working with, fostered self-determination, and co-created and co-developed initiatives with the Indigenous community. An example is the TUUSH program at UBC Farm which focused on urban indigenous populations that faced barriers in accessing nutritious traditional foods. This program created a safe space for intergenerational teachings between elders and youth where they could grow, prepare, and eat traditional foods together. Although successful, it was suspended due to the lack of funding. On the other side, we have ineffective initiatives that did not include indigenous voices, failed to recognize the role and importance of traditional and cultural foods, and finally did not address barriers and stigma associated with certain initiatives. An example would include the Nutrition North Canada program, the NNC, which increased food insecurity by 13.2% after its implementation, but has continued to receive funding with $103 million in 2020 to 2021. Throughout our research, we found gaps in research approaches, current initiatives, approaches to food insecurity, and grassroots organizations. Firstly, there is a major gap in research regarding urban Indigenous food insecurity. We need more trauma-informed research to, be, to begin recognizing the severity of this issue. To avoid perpetuating harm, the lever to this gap begins with implementing a policy that all research with Indigenous communities must implement the principles of OCAP and the research approaches of participatory action research and a two-eyed seeing approach. Secondly, current initiatives are unsuccessful because they continue to exclude Indigenous voices. Throughout our research, it was clear that the most successful initiatives are co-created with elders, chiefs, and council and Indigenous communities. Thirdly, stakeholders need to start acknowledging that simply giving food will not address food insecurity. We need a unified policy for Indigenous peoples that does not follow a rigid monolithic guideline and a commitment to addressing upstream factors working towards food security and sovereignty, and a policy that recognizes that urban, rural, reserve, and northern communities have different needs. Lastly, initiatives that make the greatest impact are Indigenous-led organizations. Throughout our research, we've heard many stories of Indigenous organizations doing great work, but shutting down or failing to expand due to under and inconsistent funding. We need to start redirecting funds from initiatives that perpetuate the issue like NNC to initiatives that make positive impacts like UGTS. Our team had the privilege of never experiencing food insecurity, and we were initially under the assumption in light of so many initiatives that this issue was adequately addressed and that it was not prevalent in urban communities. Our research was limited by our scope and the gap in existing literature. 
We also recognize that urban indigenous food insecurity will not be truly addressed until we dive into land back, land ownership and food sovereignty. To move forward and create systemic change towards sustainable food security, we identified five key points. Firstly, all stakeholders must build trust, co-create and support self-determination to avoid a colonial projection of what an indigenous person should want. Secondly, we need more trauma-informed research to shed light on this issue. At the government and policy level, initiatives must start addressing upstream by tackling intersectional disparities. Consistent funding is needed for grassroots organizations to address food insecurity holistically. Additionally, we need to amplify indigenous voices by supporting them in positions of power, agency, and government from all nations. And finally, all stakeholders must adopt indigenous ways of knowing in planning initiatives. We hope our research sheds light on the challenge of urban indigenous food insecurity. And on behalf of our team, Annika, Emily, and I thank you for your time. And we invite you to engage with us during the questioning period. Thank you, University of British Columbia. And I must commend you on seamlessly transitioning through that tiny um, Zoom glitch there. Um, well done. I will now hand it over to Nino, JP, or um, Violet for a question from the judges. Go ahead, JP. So thank you so much for that presentation. Um, you did a great job at capturing the extent to which this is a deeply complex uh, and intersectional issue uh, and really showing the extent to which there are multiple stakeholders um, that uh, can have an impact and multiple levers that need to be considered as you're thinking about that impact. I'm curious if you were to continue your work post this project, uh, where do you see, um, which, which stakeholders and solution sets do you see offering the most potential to have a scaled impact? I can begin. So I believe one of the greatest limitations that I wish without barriers we could have addressed is focusing on food sovereignty. So it is not a surprise that throughout our research, the greatest impact was from local communities by Indigenous peoples for Indigenous peoples. So if we could continue this project, we would have loved to work more within you know, our own community with more Indigenous-led organizations aside from UGTS. Would any of the other team members like to um, add on to that answer? I guess building on top of just working within the local community, we did mention government as a stakeholder that could make an impact on the indigenous community and food insecurity in general. Um, research is moving towards the idea of a basic income or increase the in minimum wage. So those policies could be a big, a game changer for food insecurity because we know that uh, income is a key predictor to food insecurity. So building on top of just food sovereignty, I think those policies like basic income, increase the minimum wage, or even policies regarding cost of living can make a big difference for people experiencing food insecurity and specific to indigenous communities, like urban indigenous communities, food sovereignty plus those policies, I think combined can make the biggest impact for this community. Emily, would you like to add on or are we good? <laughs> I have nothing to add, but thank you. Thank you and congratulations to the University of British Columbia team. Um, I will now call upon the Wilfrid Laurier University team to please bring up your slides. Give me one moment to get you both spotlighted here. All right, you are good to go. One victim in Canada can make a sex trafficker around $300,000 in a year. Traffickers have said that it is a better investment than real estate because you can sell them over and over and over again. These are human beings we are talking about, usually young girls between ages 12 to 14. This is modern day slavery in Canada. Hello everyone, my name is Alexa Stuka and this is my little brother Coleman Stuka. 
Hi everyone, today we'll be talking to you about our research on sex trafficking in Canada. So what is sex trafficking? Sex trafficking is different from sex work and is defined as the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, obtaining, patronizing, or soliciting of a person for the purpose of a commercial sex act. It involves the use of force, fraud, or coercion to make an adult engage in commercial sex acts. However, any commercial sexual activity with a minor, even without force, fraud, or coercion, is still considered trafficking. The government of Canada describes sex trafficking as a form of modern day slavery. There's a demand for sex with exploited victims and traffickers meet this demand by luring, grooming, isolating, and then exploiting victims. The first step in the trafficking process is luring victims by identifying their vulnerabilities and then building connections to take advantage of them. Traffickers will then groom victims by providing for their basic needs and wants. After this, they will attempt to isolate victims by cutting off any support systems that they may have and becoming their sole provider. Once this process has been completed, sex traffickers will exploit victims with threats and manipulation in order to force them into the sex trade. A common trend that is occurring is that traffickers will build intimate relationships with victims as a way to build trust, consequently making it easier to exploit them. Victims of sex trafficking can be abused sexually multiple times a day at the hands of traffickers who pimp them out for anyone willing to pay for sex. Sex trafficking is a complex issue with many stakeholders involved. The key stakeholders are Johns, traffickers, victims, and communities. Johns are those who pay for sex with exploited victims, usually males. Traffickers are people who exploit victims for profit. And victims are usually young women who have been forced and coerced into performing sexual acts within the sex trade by traffickers. Lastly, communities are the places where sex trafficking is happening like towns, cities, and public places to gather. It is important to understand that sex trafficking is not a one-dimensional issue. There are many layers and factors to examine that allow for the problem to take place. The main causes that hold sex trafficking in place are greed, lust, vulnerability, and ignorance. To further understand the problem, it is important to know and understand how each one of these connects to a stakeholder. Greed is what motivates a trafficker to traffic. Sex trafficking is a lucrative business with high profits and relatively low risk because of how difficult it is to prosecute and convict traffickers. Lust is what causes Johns to pay for sex. Sexual fantasies and illusions, hostile masculinity and sexual aggression all can contribute to why John may participate in the sex trade. Vulnerability causes victims to be more susceptible to sex trafficking. Factors that can cause vulnerabilities are poverty, mental health issues, domestic violence, family dynamics, and being a part of a disenfranchised group. Ignorance also plays a part in holding sex trafficking in place as a lack of awareness allows for sex traffickers to operate unnoticed in communities across Canada. Causes of ignorance may be a lack of education and knowledge relating to the issue, misconceptions being portrayed by the media, and varying levels of privilege. Sexism, racism, and colonialism all contribute to creating unhealthy power dynamics that allow for traffickers and johns to exploit victims. Women of color are affected by sex trafficking at disproportionate rates. For example, Indigenous women make up 51% of all sex trafficking victims in Canada. This fact can be traced back to a long history of oppression and colonialism involving residential schools and intergenerational trauma. A lot is being done to combat sex trafficking. The United Nations came out with a framework and protocol to combat sex trafficking, and the Canadian government followed suit by implementing the framework of the three Ps. The solution landscape can be divided into prevention, protection, and prosecution. Some examples of prevention efforts are implementing anti-trafficking campaigns and increasing awareness in schools. Protection efforts focus on providing trauma care and resources to victims. And prosecution focuses on laws and legislations to combat sex trafficking. Although there is a lot being done from interviews and research, many agree that it is not enough when it lacks the fourth P, which is partnership. The quote on the screen clearly defines the importance of this when it states, since no single professional agency or system can effectively serve human sex trafficking survivors in isolation, effective services must integrate multidisciplinary expertise, survivor input and leadership and cross sector partnership. After having interviews with two survivor supporting organizations, it is clear that there's a lack of partnership within the Canadian solution landscape. It was iterated in these interviews that partnership between prevention, protection, and prosecution efforts, as well as including survivor voices, is the direction that organizations and the government are wanting to work towards, as no one individual or organization can combat sex trafficking alone 
what involves the help of everyone. From our research, we identified four gaps and their levers of change. The first gap and lever we discovered was that there is not enough focus on the perpetrators. Most anti-sex trafficking campaigns focus on what may cause a victim to be more susceptible to the problem, but lack a focus on why traffickers traffic and why Johns pay for sex. Pulling on the lever of the lack of focus on the perpetrators would change the framework of prevention efforts. This would have impacts on laws, legislations, and how to better serve victims. The second gap that we identified was how society understands the objectification of women. Objectifying and devaluing women has become a societal norm. From a young age, men see and often emulate these behaviors, which builds the foundation for someone to become a trafficker or a John. Pulling on the lever of education would bring awareness and understanding that could help shape how society views women as current education programs focus on young girls and how to not be groomed, but lack the teaching of young boys to value women. The next gap we identified was economic safety nets. Many Canadians currently live below the poverty line. Poverty is a contributing factor to vulnerability and makes it easier for traffickers to lure and groom victims into the sex trade. Pulling on the lever of lack of livable wage would remove or at least lessen the effects of this crucial factor that can lead to sex trafficking. Because victims would be at less risk of being sex trafficked if they had sufficient financial means of their own to meet their own basic needs. The final gap that we discovered was a mistrust and lack of faith between victims and people in positions of power who are meant to take care of them. Prosecution rates are low in convicting traffickers, so victims have little confidence in law enforcement's ability to help them. Without the relationship between victims and first responders like law enforcement, paramedics, crisis response workers, counselors, and nurses being improved, victims and survivors will continue to be underserved and lack the important trust that must exist for any solution to be successful. Pulling on the lever of lack of relationships with first responders would have impacts on prevention, protection, and prosecution measures to care for victims in a trauma-informed way. We use the visual of a stream flowing into a, a pond because what we have learned is that to fully combat the issue and to put an end to modern day slavery, we need to move upstream and look at the systems and mental models that hold the issue in place and cause the negative impacts downstream. Capitalism, systems of oppression, the internet, and a mindset of objectification are systems and structures providing a platform for sex trafficking to exist. If solution efforts only focus on what is happening in the pond and its impacts and don't look at ways to address the systems and root causes, they will not be as effective as the problem will keep coming downstream. Our key takeaway from this experience is how much power is given to the issue when it stays hidden. The misconceptions that are presented in the media and the overpowering mindset of objectifying women create space for sex trafficking to happen all around us. As society members and men in particular, we need to do better. We must value and respect women. It is on us to do our part to break down the mindset of objectification of women. In closing, sex trafficking is a real and growing problem in Canada, and knowing about the problem is an important start, but it is then what we do with that knowledge that makes the change. Thank you. Thank you, Alexa and Coleman. I will now call on I will now call on one of the judges, either Nino or Violaine, to ask a question um, of, of this team. Go ahead, Nino. Hello, yes, I can try. Thank you so much. Uh, such an interesting presentation and, and such an important topic. And thank you for um, dealing with this very emotionally charged topic as well. Um, I wanted to, I mean, I was looking at your visual map and you have this history of trafficking um, where you kind of try and trace it back in back in 1500s, so just showing that as a phenomenon, this is not a new thing. It's just seems to be so uh, resilient that it, it kind of changes over time as, as there is response um, evolving, but also as, as, as the history develops. So it, it had all these different shapes and forms over, over the centuries. So I wondered, maybe you could um, uh, tell us why you found this uh, historical uh, timeline important to, um, to track and what, what did you learn from it and how this historical panoramic view of the phenomena can help us, um, uh, can help us develop solutions as well. 
For sure. Yeah, I think it's important understanding, especially in connection to objectifying women, that sometimes things come out in the media and things get um, amplified and we think it's just a recent issue, but this historical timeline shows, as you said, it's been happening from the beginning and it's just building in new ways and with different systems that come about in society that have been deep rooted, they find new ways to come about and in connection, um, yeah, just to colonialism and the history of just conquering and having the colonial mindset of wanting to take over. It's just important to see that history in the, the connections and just how deep rooted it is. And it was interesting seeing the history, how it was on, some of it was on a global scale, but then also in connection um, to Canadian history with residential schools and the 60s scoop in the Indian Act. It's important to have both those connections because it's a crucial issue here in Canada, but also around the world. Yeah, and just, and just adding on that, I think it's important just to note to really get to get the context of, of what we're dealing with, because sex trafficking is such a, a complex issue. I um, mean, there's so many deep rooted things. And as, as we we're going through our research, we, we realized how there's so many things that are just so deeply rooted in our culture that kind of allows for this to, to be this issue to be held in place. And these things don't just come into play immediately. It takes time for these things to 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 grow in society and, and take root. I mean, so I think it's really important as we look through sort of the historical timeline of, of this issue is that, that this has been going on for, for hundreds of years and it's sort of, this is what has led us to this point. And then I think when we sort of know, okay, this is, this is how we got here, then it, it, it helps us sort of um, in a way dismantle these things and sort of approach the issue in a more informed way to really um, tackle this issue in a more, like I said, more informed way. Thank you, Nino. Um, thank you, Alexa and Coleman. Um, Great presentation, and I will now call on the um, Humber College team to please bring up their slides. Do you see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Give me one moment to spotlight your entire team here. All right, whenever you are ready, you are good to go. Perfect. Just one moment here. Alrighty. <clears throat> Thank you for having us today. We would like to start today by posing a question. If food is not explicitly stated to be a human right in Canada, who is obligated to take care of food insecure individuals? The current food system disadvantages vulnerable populations, creates and perpetuates preventable diseases, and promotes environmental degradation. Food insecurity is typically understood as the acute condition of hunger rather than a broader and more encompassing condition brought on by chronic poverty and socioeconomic exclusion. Without a more holistic understanding, current solutions to food insecurity tend to ensure low-income individuals remain food insecure. We will explore the interconnections and gaps in existing solutions and underlying mental models that perpetuate a dysfunctional food system, one that understands food as a commodity rather than a right or a common good and thus makes no connection between equitable access to healthy food and the overall health and well-being of the people in Toronto and our global environment. To understand the problem landscape associated with food insecurity, first, we have to address what forces the system to dysfunction, the underlying structures and mental models. Mental models reinforce the underlying structures of a deeply dysfunctional system, which generates problematic trends and contributes to the prevalence of food insecurity amongst Toronto's most vulnerable. Overall, the current mental models reflect a neoliberal market mindset that perceives food as a commodity and not a human right. As a result, food insecurity is seen as an individual issue, and food as a commodity mindset becomes the foundation for underlying structures of food insecurity. Food insecure Torontonians have to answer difficult questions every day and month in order to survive in Toronto. Do I spend money on rent or groceries? Can I feed my family? Will the food bank have what I need? Food insecurity is largely rooted in income inequality, but there are several factors that perpetuate the issue of food insecurity and what we call the poverty cycle. Let's look at these components. Living in Toronto is expensive. The cost of living does not align with wages earned. Research in 2019 suggests that individuals need just over $22 an hour to lead a healthy life in Toronto compared to the $14 an hour minimum wage in 2019. 
About one third of food insecure households utilize social assistance, but this has not been kept up with inflation and contributes to the widening gap between income required to pay bills, such as groceries. Food insecure Toronto, individuals in Toronto spend most of their monthly income on rent. Furthermore, the cost of living for an individual in 2021 is estimated to cost approximately $3,000 a month, but if an individual makes minimum wage and works full time, they would still be about $800 short each month. Food prices also continue to increase each year. In 2021, food prices are expected to increase an additional 3 to 5%. In order to stay competitive on the global market, and as a result of the competitive monopolization of grocery chains, food prices are kept high. There are a few ways in which this is maintained, throwing out edible food and price fixing. The food system is globalized. The often unseen consequence of a globalized system is the negative impacts it has on the environment, causing environmental degradation, which in turn makes food more expensive. Not only is food expensive, it is difficult to access. Food deserts are neighborhoods that do not have access to quality and affordable food, and up to 51% of Torontonians live in neighborhoods that are considered food deserts, forcing them to spend more money on transportation to access healthy food. This dysfunctional system further impacts individuals in regards to health, education, and other unintended consequences. Preventable illness is a serious consequence of inadequate food, including chronic illness and mental health impacts, which can affect individuals later in life. These health consequences also place a significant strain on the healthcare system. In 2005, the total annual healthcare cost for severely food insecure households was 121% higher than food secure households. Food insecurity also impacts the individual's performance in education and access to post-secondary training. Other serious consequences to food insecurity include an increase in intimate partner violence and an increased risk for involvement with the law as a result of socioeconomic challenges. As such, although income inequality is the predominant factor of food insecurity in Toronto, there are several key elements exasperating it within the poverty cycle that keeps vulnerable populations food and income insecure. Next, Hannah will go over the current solution landscape. Thank you, Shannon. Current food insecurity solutions include actors in civil society organizations, the government and corporate entities. Arguably, one of the largest actors in the solution landscape is food banks. Food banks operate as a stopgap solution to address hunger in communities, and it's supposed to be a short-term emergency response. However, it's often passed off as a long-term solution by governments and subsequent policy. This is the shifting the burden archetype. When local grassroots organizations empower people to harvest their own food in the means of community garden and urban farming, it's called food sovereignty. These spaces facilitate education and community building. When a corporate entity utilizes resources to promote social well-being in the community, it's called corporate social responsibility, or CSR. Current CSR initiatives that impact food system include reduction in food, lo food loss and waste or offering slightly imperfect foods for a cheaper price. The three levels of government that are responsible for policies that help alleviate food insecurity. For example, the federal government has set three policy frameworks to address food insecurity. It is important to note that none of these documents explicitly acknowledges food as a human right, or that Canada has a legal obligation to fulfill this right. And in doing such, separates the access to food from health and well-being of citizens. The Ontario government supports CSOs through grants for infrastructure and job training. The City of Toronto promotes Toronto's poverty reduction strategy to address poverty with an aim to increase food access among social programs. Fundamentally, the root cause of food insecurity is inadequate income, and the current solutions do not address this issue, but rather perpetuate the shifting the burden archetype as the current policy solutions focus on food banks. The City of Toronto proclaims that food banks are perhaps the most recognizable response to food insecurity, despite food banks explicitly stating that they're a temporary solution to address hunger, the acute condition. Food activists, researchers, food banks lobby for an evidence-based policy reform to address root causes of food insecurity. Additional concerns with the policy focusing on food, in, in food banks include a distorted public perception of the function of food banks. Food insecure, food insecure households regards food bank as a last resort, with only 21% of the food insecure households utilizing its services. This is partially due to the inaccessibility of food bank programs, such as limited hours of operation, and ability to address specific dietary needs of beneficiaries. Food donated by the public to food banks entrenches a charity mindset, understanding food insecurity as an individually caused problem, as opposed to a systemic issue. Furthermore, the food donated to charities is often processed, shelf-stable food that is high in carbohydrates, refined sugar, and sodium, all of which are linked to health problems such as diabetes and obesity, issues most prevalent in low-income families. 
This displays a clear gap between hunger and food insecurity at the level of government policy and practice, rather shifts the burden of food insecurity onto food banks. Lack of income, the fundamental cause of food insecurity goes unaddressed. And next, over to Natsuki for points of intervention. Okay, thank you, Hannah. So as we can see, there are a variety of solutions to food insecurity, but none of these solutions can be applied to the root cause of food insecurity in China. Research suggests that a living wage, a basic income guarantee, as well as adjusting social assistance to meet the inflation would reduce the prevalence of food insecurity. However, it is not enough. The entire system needs to be taken into account as it doesn't address the fundamental problem of the fact that our food system in China is not seen as an integral part of the population's health or a human right within Canada. In addition to living wage policies, locally produced nutritious food must be affordable and accessible for all. Farmers can be adequately compensated for their labor through government subsidies, which can then be sold for an affordable price, effectively increasing access to food and reducing hunger. In pursuit of the resolution to food insecurity, there's an opportunity for a strategic alliance between versatile actors in the food, sy food system advocacy movements to ensure the well-being of Torontonians through access to quality food. Foodshare is an organization in Toronto that utilizes a system approach to addressing the root causes of food insecurity that advocates for food justice and fighting food oppression. Our project reveals that current solutions to food insecurity provide temporary fixes and shift responsibility to low-income individuals and food charities. Food insecurity in Toronto is not an issue of food quantity, but of a serious lack of attention to social inequalities and the complexity of the food system such as acknowledging food as a human right and as a part of a citizen's health and well-being. One of the things we learned was that we had preconceptions about food insecurity that solely focused on an increase to minimum wage and improvements to social services as, as feasible solutions. But we realized that we fell into one of the system traps as it was still market solution, market, made, uh, market mode solution. We understood that connections need to be seen across the whole system, including underlying mental models in order for potential solutions to shift the system away from food insecurity and towards food justice, where all Torontonians can have access to healthy and good quality food. Thank you. Thank you to Humber College. Such a great, an, another great presentation. I'm so excited by all of the presentations today. Um, I will now hand it over to Violin um, to ask a question of this team. Yes, hi, hi, very good presentation. Um, um, since Toronto is a very diverse city, uh, sorry, can you hear me better like this? Uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry. So, so Toronto is a very multicultural uh, city, one of the most multicultural city uh, cities in Canada. So I, I'm just curious, have you come across through your research and observations different types of community resilience mechanisms based on the cultural identity of, of some communities. And I, it would be interesting to know like if some communities have different types of, of uh, systems they can rely on, for instance, um, you know, uh, helping each other within the same community or uh, anything that you, you, you've you seen that uh, that would highlight more like the social aspect of the of the solutions maybe hi there um throughout our research we definitely try to highlight um certain communities that have been resilient to food insecurity because it's such an ingrained problem within toronto society and depending on where you are either socioeconomically or just economically tends to determine the response made by the community to address food insecurity, especially at this nice grassroots level that a lot of food projects are based out of, particularly like food share. So what we've seen, uh, particularly in like the Toronto Syrian refugee community, um, being supported by um, Food Share and Food Secure Canada is a type of resilience that particularly meets the needs of Syrian refugees in the terms of, you know, more culturally appropriate food, 
more culturally diverse food so that they can really, you know, establish um, the connection between like food and society and the place in society. I'm going to pass it on to my other teammates, see if they have anything to add as well. Yeah, um, great points made by Shannon. I wanted to kind of highlight the fact that we did work with a lot of, um, throughout our research process, we had to look into local grassroots initiatives within Toronto, because I think it kind of represents Toronto's uniqueness in that sense. Um, and throughout our like volunteer placement positions, we've kind of seen that newcomers face this like new type of um, barriers in, ten, in, uh, in terms of like cultural sensitivity, language barrier. So an example that I can pull up right at the top of my head is um, community-based um, gardens. So there is a specific community that I can recall in North Etobicoke where these two condominiums have these like very versatile different people, different immigrants from various backgrounds. I think like 65% of them speak Arabic and a lot of them face a lot of um, language barriers. So they can't find certain items for their cuisine they can't um, communicate that well. And so these community gardens became this um, community-based cultivation sense where they can communicate with one another, get over that language barrier, also have um, lead their own initiative in terms of what kind of food they get to have access to or what they get to do. So it's like um, they get to lead this initiative amongst themselves and build a, um, build a sense of camaraderie amongst each other. So that was something that was really um, interesting to see and it was led by this um it was supported by the African food basket so that was inspiring yeah just yeah both of them talked everything but yeah I just added the Africa food basket initiatives so the organization is supporting those immigrants in North Etobicoke area they are more than like more than half of the population are immigrants there and then they are they are working with those immigrants as autonomous agents because um, they have the voice to have what we what they want to eat, so yeah, so they are providing the resource to do their own urban farming so that they can have more culturally appropriate food that they used to eat their own countries, and then they cannot have access to those food in uh, local uh, grocery stores here. So yeah, they have. Once they get resources, they can manage themselves. So yeah, we need to see themselves as autonomous agents and then we respect their own cultural food and then quality food and the access to, we need to ensure that. So yeah, this is my, our answer. Thank you, Humber College for again, another outstanding presentation. Um, I will now bring up, um, that concludes all of the presentations for room A. Um, congratulations to everybody for again, your wonderful presentations today. Um, before we introduce our keynote panelists, um, the judges will soon be leaving to a private Zoom room um, to deliberate. I'm going to just remove some of these spotlights here. One minute. Um, judges, give me one minute and I will get the, um, the link for you in the chat box here. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to bring up the polls. Um, for everyone to vote for their audience favorite today. So on your screen, um, you should see a, a polling. Um, it is anonymous um, and you are able to vote for one team. Um, so please, please vote for your favorite presentation today um, now. <laughs> I'm sorry, James Stotch, are you with us? Can you turn on your camera? James, we can't find you. I can't find you in the, sorry, Ren, we're having a little bit of tech stuff here. Okay, this might be you.
Okay, James, are you in the, are you here now? There's James and Daniela, are you here as well? Yes, I'm here now. There we go. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so. All right. And Daniela's here too. Hi, yes. Hey, yeah. great. Um, so you will have 10 more seconds to please poll. Um, please put in your favorite team there. All of the guests that were in stream B, or room B, will now be jumping over as well. Um, so again, if you are finished polling, please do so. Um, judges, give me one minute and I will get you the link for where we can go to deliberate. All right, judges, um, we will now leave. There is a, a link in the chat box for us to go to a private Zoom room and I will hand it over to, I will pull down the poll. Thank you, everybody. All right, thank you, Tash. Um, and good, good luck with your deliberations, judges. I'm glad I don't have to be a judge for this because uh, I, at least uh, talking from our room, uh, boy, it was incredible. Uh, to see to see the four in in stream B, and I'm sure stream A was was equally amazing. Um, so uh, we'll get started with the keynote presentation in just a moment. Um, we're just going to wait for the folks who attended room B to join us back here, and uh, the judges, of course, will be going off to their own private Zoom room to deliberate, and then they'll be back shortly uh, for the announcements of the winners. All right, so we're thrilled to welcome Daniela Pappy Thornton, the founder and creator of the Map the System competition as our keynote speaker. Daniela is an educator and author whose work focuses on social entrepreneurship and systems-led leadership. Daniela has served as a lecturer at Yale School of Management, at the Watson, Watson Institute, Oxford Said Business School, where she was the deputy director of the School Center for Social Entrepreneurship, she designed an educational tool called the Impact Gaps Canvas, used uh, an accelerator programs and social impact educated, education initiatives around the world. And you've probably seen examples in, uh, in this competition today, certainly we did in the other room where the Gaps Canvas was used. Um, and of course she launched Map the System, which is a contest now running at uh, 50 plus global, global institutions. So Daniela has served as a consultant, advisor, and trainer at a range of enterprises from public companies to private foundations. Her work builds upon six years of emerging market entrepreneurial experience in Cambodia, running a hybrid social enterprise. She's also co-authored a book called Learning Service, and her TEDx talk on reclaiming social entrepreneurship and elevating impact uh, highlights some of her thinking. So having the privilege of collaborating with Daniela in creating the student guide to mapping a system alongside our former colleague Anna Johnson. I can speak firsthand to Daniela's humility, grounded approach to learning, and ability to challenge and push students to embrace their change-making potential, but without taking on a heroic persona. In every way, she is a model educator and the best exemplar of social change learning that I know of. So following her presentation, Guests will be able to ask a few questions using the Q&A function. So over to you, Daniela. Thanks, James. Those of you who don't know James, he is incredible. And my first thing I want to say to all of you is we have all had more than enough Zoom in our life. And the fact that you were able to make these amazing presentations and do them over Zoom and for the judges to be here from all different uh, you know, places. I just am so impressed with what you guys have put together. And I have to say, I haven't seen anything that seems to have worked so smoothly and um, gone so well. So high fives, everyone. Um, and I am going to share my screen and I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about why 
we started Map the System. Here we go. And but first, so I did my high fives already, but we'll get to more high fives for the, pres the presenters in a second. Um, so why do we start Map the System? Okay, so I believe that one of the most important skills that people can have is to be able to see and understand and think about how things work in a system. And I think that traditionally uh, there are, uh, oh, someone's not muted. Okay, traditionally there are, th there are some courses that really teach that well. And a lot of you might come from those disciplines. I came from the discipline of a business background where I thought that was not taught well. And I thought that this is the image of how I thought uh, business was teaching social impact when they started to take on social entrepreneurship or social change within a business world. And they were teaching, you know, start something, make it bigger, gain more market share, outcompete your competitors. And those of you who are, who are doing um, interdisciplinary work or those of you who are probably in other uh, in other disciplines have realized, actually social change doesn't happen that way. It looks something more like this, right? There's new initiatives, there's things that connect up, there's government involved, there's nonprofits, there's for-profits, there's a whole mix. And when we have a complex social and environmental challenge, complex one like all the ones you all have been exploring, it's never gonna be solved by one organization, right? So the initiative to start Map the System came out of this research that I had done called Tackling Heropreneurship um, and the, the Impact Gaps Canvas that James just mentioned. And the Impact Gaps Canvas is the frame, the initial frame for Map the System. It said, how can we create a contest where we can incentivize people to not compete to say, here's how I'm gonna solve this problem, but instead to incentivize people to really deeply learn about and understand a problem within a system, what's happening, what's holding it in place, what are the numbers, and also incentivize a learning of who's already trying to solve this so that people can identify gaps. And you guys have done that so beautifully today. And my hope when, when I helped to start this was that we could incentivize people to realize there's a whole bunch of tools that can be used to impact change in a system. It's not just a tool of, a new startup or not just, you know, some people are really, you know, stuck on one tool, hammer, new startup, new startup. Some people have experience of a tool, maybe a tool that's research, right? Research and publication, right? But there's activism, there's movement building, there's, I think you can be an entrepreneurial journalist, you can be an, um, you know, have impact through, you um, through any not entrepreneurship, right? Through and existing organizations, right? And there's different tools that are needed. And what you get to do is think about which tool do I want to use next, right? So the initially, um, I'm gonna to skip this, we'll get back to it. Initially, I thought, why should people join this? Okay, to better understand a problem and to learn from others. And my hope is that you've done that. My hope is that you've interviewed or researched organizations, and clearly you have to have gotten to this point today. But my hope would be that you found some organizations that you're like, wow, I didn't even know that existed. Wow, I didn't know that that, that was happening. Maybe that's my next internship, right? Maybe that's where I wanna apply for a job, right? And you've hopefully also through this process, built some new relationships, both with your teammates, but also with the people that you've learned from. And that can help you um, in the future open doors with potential future partners. And by partners, I mean, could also be your future boss. It could be an organization that you start, uh, that you decide to work with, that you, you know, you apply for a role in, in government, right? So these relationships, uh, the number one thing I think you have as an asset right now, those of you who are participants, is that you are a student. You have an email address of a student and you can now, if you haven't already reached out to people, you can email them and say, look, I've just done this research on this issue that you are working on. And here's what we've you know, understood so far in our, in our research. And I'm really interested in getting involved in this sector when I graduate. Right? I'm really interested in, in learning more and, and using this topic for my next project in a different class, right? 
And those relationships will really be able to serve you well if those are the doors that you'd like to open, if this is the work you wanna do in the future. So I highly recommend that you do that. And then you've probably also identified different gaps in the system than you might've originally gone in thinking about. And some of you shared that in your presentation today. And so I just wanna share a few examples of people who've used this type of thinking in their work and how this way of thinking that you have just learned through doing Map the System is not, uh, it's not just an asset, the content of what you've learned, you've now deeply learned about an issue, but the process that you have gone through to learn about that issue is now a skill set that you have and you've honed so well that you are you know, here today. And the people are in need of that skill set in sectors, you know, all in all across the different sectors. So you've had some past Canadian finalists who were looking at mental health issues in college, and they identified a different gap. And you've probably heard about heard about their work. And they said, actually, we want to now focus on middle school. Because we've looked at the system, we've identified a different gap, right? Here's an, a nonprofit, an organization, a social venture that, had, that used this type of thinking to identify a different gap. A pond is based in Bangladesh, and they work in garment factories, and they sell low-cost insurance by as kind of like a reward system in their little shops that they have in garment factories. So they have shops that sell food and sell um, all sorts of daily necessary items. And the mostly women who work there, the, the women who work in the garment factories can come shop. And every time they spend money at these shops, they're able to earn credit towards low cost insurance. Okay? They went through a process similar to what you have all done with Map the System. They did it through the Ashoka Globalizer program that uses some of the same tools that you, you've probably used to get here. And through that process, they looked at the system and they identified what they were hoping, um, you know, what they thought was unhealthy and, and how they hoped that the system might be able to be changed. And they came up with a different gap. Instead of just selling low cost insurance, they realized that there was a gap, that there was no market for low cost insurance. And what that means is they went back into their organization. Instead of saying, we just need to sell more. We're in one factory, we're in two factories, we're in 10 factories. We actually want to create competitors. We want to get other companies to start selling low cost insurance, right? And so they had to get system thinkers like you all Right? They had to ha have employees who have the skills that you have now to think through this and start to change their organization so that they can influence change. This type of thinking is also useful in for-profit companies. Care.com is a public company and they, uh, you can hire nannies through them or you can hire senior care workers and they use the same tools in the impact gap canvas and this type of thinking in their organization to look at the system because they realized most of many of the people who are doing senior care work are uh, have migrated to to America if, if we're looking simply uh, in in the their U.S. offices, which, which was where I was helping them work, or they've realized that there's different laws, different immigration laws, and and things that are impacting people. You know um, how people are paid above. The, on the books or off the books. And there's these things in the system that were harming their potential future um, participants of care.com. And so they were realizing, gosh, if we just stay blind and we only focus on our organization, we're missing the opportunity to help change a system that's unhealthy, right? So the skill sets that you've learned through the classes that you've taken to get here, or just, you know, if through map the system, if this was the first time you've started to, to, to do a, a system mapping process, those skills are applicable in businesses, they're applicable in nonprofits, they're applicable in governments. And there are people out there who will, wanna, who will want to hire you because of those skill sets. So what you've done is a process probably similar to this. You've identified the system that you wanted to work on and that was subjective. You got to choose, what do we care about? What are we interested in? What do we wanna learn about, right? Then you researched and mapped 
the systems and you looked at gaps when we got to just see some of those presentations today, which are impressive and beautiful. And you've come up with, you know, really interesting identification of gaps. And now you get to decide what to do with this, right? What do you want to do? Well, it's objective-ish, I said. So it's objective-ish because nobody can ever know a whole system, right? We could go through this process for a few months on Map the System. We could go through it through a few, for a few years doing our PhD. And we will always still have our own perspective and our own sphere of, of strength of what part of the system we understand. But the more energy we put in, the more we have identified different places in the system that we now have a little more understanding. Now you get to decide, what do I want to do with this? Do I want to share this learning in some way? Do I want to share it back to all the, the people that I've interviewed or, or the re, you know, who, whose research I've used? Do I want to reach out to them on Twitter, on email, however, whatever that looks like? Gather a group of people. And I know a lot of uh, different Canadian team finalists and, and finalists around the world have have met with some of these uh, stakeholders with these issues and said, what do we want to do together now that we've learned? And if this is something that you want to do in the future, either using these type of skills as a system thinker or working in the specific field that you've researched, you can now transfer this into your future career, right? So you've now, now get to look inside and say, what do I like? What am I interested in? which of these levers is most, most interesting to me, right? And you get to start thinking about how do, what do I want to do in relation to, to this work in the future? And so to me, that is winning, right? Winning is not whoever's name gets called in a little bit. Winning is how did I take what I learned and transfer it into a high impact career, right? How have I been able, what am I going to do with this now? And if this has opened any doors for you, or if this has changed your thinking, you've won, okay? That's, I, I in part, really feel yucky that the, when we created Math the System, that we made it as a competition. Because really what we're learning is that we can't compete to solve problems in the world, right? But we did that simply to create a, a counterbalance to some of the other competitive um, contests that are in universities that are focused on solving. And so we said, well, let's make a competition that's focused on learning. And my hope is that all of you feel like you have learned something and clearly you have in order to have done the presentations that you've done today. So I'm really impressed. And I want to share, I wanted to go back to that slide. I said I'd skip, give you a little whiplash by going back. This is a report by Baljeet Sandhu called the, the Value of Lived Experience. And the other thing I wanted to touch on of another reason for why we started Map the System was to give people um, a way to consider and, and reconsider possibly the, the value of lived expertise. And you've probably come across this in your courses or in your work uh, researching uh, for your presentations today. But if you haven't, what, the, what this means is that there's a lived experience of a social or environmental challenge, right? So if I'm somebody who, let's say I was homeless in the past, my CV might not say that. My CV might say a whole bunch of other things, right? But if I'm looking to create change and influence change in, the, in, this, in a sector related to homelessness, actually my lived experience of homelessness is a huge asset to, to the work that I'm about to do, right? And so those of us who want to create change around an issue that we have lived, this is an opportunity to embrace our own lived experience and highlight that and, and be you know, proud and connected uh, to others with lived expertise as we do that work. And for those of us who want to work on an issue that we didn't live, which is totally fine too, because there's a lot of, you know, things that you might be passionate about that haven't impacted you directly, then map the system is a piece of a way to start thinking about how to apprentice with a problem, which I would say is kind of the opposite of the lived experience. I haven't lived it. And if I don't know enough, a lot about it now, how could I start to learn more? And you can start to do that through research, through, you know, through what you've done so far. And now you can start to do that 
through going out and finding a, 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 a job or research assistant role, an internship or whatever that looks like in that sector to start to gain more of an understanding and apprentice with that problem further. I'm gonna skip a little whoop, whiplash. And I wanna tell you um, about Sophie. And I just wanna give you an example of a student who through this type of thinking was able to find a different path than she'd originally thought for her career. She gave me permission to share this photo and this story. And she had originally um, pitched an idea for a women's feminine hygiene product company for Sub-Saharan Africa. And I was assigned as her mentor in the, in the work that she was doing. And so we started to look at the issue and I asked her to do some of the, the things that you guys have done through Map the System. And then we got to do a little internal looking, right? Which I, which like I said, that's kind of the next step. It's like, okay, I've done this Map the System. I've, I've done my research. Now, who am I in relation to this issue? Who do, what do I really, what do I, what am I passionate about? What do I care about? And we started to explore what, what her strengths were and what she loved. And what she realized was, you know, she shared with me that she's like a really strong researcher. She actually loves research. It's really interesting to her. And what we found was even just in our little bit of conversations that, that, that we had done, we'd found that there was at least, there was more than 20 women's feminine hygiene products in Sub-Saharan Africa, just from one uh, nonprofit funder that we had found. They had invested in 20 different models. So there's room for a 21st or a 22nd. But what she realized through this process was, you know what I'm really passionate about? I'm really passionate about this topic and I don't need to start a new venture. I can look at these 21 and do research and then write a report that says, here's the different models that they're using. Here's um, what seems to be working and what doesn't and where they're working and who's selling these products and what they're made out of. and all these things so that when I put that out into the world, whoever starts a new one of these later or whatever funder is looking to, to support this work can read my research and hopefully um, better support this, this system of, of change agents because of the research I've done. And watching her find that connection between an issue she cared about and what she was passionate about and good, and good at was like watching somebody just find their perfect plug that they fit into in the, in the wall. So that is my hope for you is, I love, there's, there's a quote that says, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and then go out and do that because what the world needs is people who've come alive. So don't go be a doctor because you're someone told you to be a doctor if you don't like blood, right? There, you have just proven through your work that there are so many possible levers of change on each of the issues that we care about. And so my hope for you is that you can find your place to plug in that feels electric to you and feels like, wow, I have found my, my spot. Um, so thank you. And I, I don't know if we have time for questions. I'm happy to stay, stay, stay for some questions. I don't know if the judges need to come back, but um, over, that, over to you. I don't want to, I know you, you have another meeting to, to get no, to. No, no, I'm okay meeting. for another 10 yeah. minutes. I'm good. Okay, okay great. Um, uh, we're just waiting for, uh, for word from the judges. Uh, not sure yet if they've made their decision. So if anyone has a question, please just pop it into the chat and. Uh, Let's do it. And I just want to echo, uh, that, well, so much of what you said resonates, but. Um, I had a recent experience where uh, I was chatting with a multi-billion dollar uh, uh, global company, um, senior executives, and I mentioned Map the System and they said, tell, tell us more. And so I kept on describing what it was all about. And they were like, we need that. We need that for our employees. People are not thinking that way often enough and not enough people. And, and so what you said really resonates. Like it's, it's really obvious how this applies to if you're working in the public sector or the nonprofit sector, um, but it may be a little less obvious if you're working in the commercial realm. But um, yeah, I can certainly say that it, it really resonates as an important uh, skill set, 21st century skill set, I think. Yeah. And, you know, promote it, share it. And really, if you think in this way, 
people need you. And, and when I was working with care.com, like I said, big public company, they said, you know, it's easy for me to hire a website developer. It's easy for us to hire a program manager, but it's hard to find people who really have these skills. So you clearly have them and congratulations to all of you. Um, I don't know if Tosh is coming on to tell us we need to go, but if there are any pressing student questions or anyone wants to ask, I'm really happy to, to, to answer. Um, go for it. And you can, you can type it in or you can speak. I don't know how. I've got one question. Um, thank Daniela. you, Christopher. First of all, th thank you for the presentation. Like I, I really appreciate the fact that um, and like, correct me if, if I'm wrong, but like what, what you're saying is, is, is like, you don't need to reinvent the wheel and build another 20 wheels to fix a problem. You need to talk to the wheel maker um, or you need to consider what other wheels are out there. And so like, I really appreciate how, um, how much you communicate the value of systems thinking. I was just wondering, it, like as an undergrad, if we want to continue this work in the future, um, like, are there places or like programs or um, like ne next sure, steps sure. that you could recommend? Because this is really yeah. exciting. Awesome. That is so great, Chris. Thank you for asking that. So I, I would start, if you're an undergrad, I would go talk to a professor who you know gets this and say, what other classes should I take that are like this? What will help me think about systems? You know, what else is available while I'm still a student? And then when you graduate, um, there are different programs. Like there's the Academy for Systems Change. There's the School for Systems Change. There's um, an online, you could start this now, a free course um, through Plus Acumen that is a systems change course taught by Robert Sigliano um, that they offer a couple of times a year. So there are, there are other learning opportunities if, you're, if your institution doesn't, um, it doesn't have things, but I'm sure there's a lot of tangential uh, things that you could be learning. And then if you have an issue that you care about, now you have a way to start thinking about who do I want to work with? Who do I want to do an internship with? Do they think about systems already? You know, who, you can start, you have questions to start asking, right? That, that are instead of saying, you know, tell me about your organization, you can say, tell me, how does your organization interact with other organizations in the sector? Or how does your organization value, add value to a, a wider system of change, you know? And if they can answer that, great. It means they can start to think like that. Um, if they can't answer that, maybe they need you so that they can start to think like that, right? Um, so I hope that helps. I'm happy to, to, to share more if you wanna ask anything uh, to me directly mm -hmm. as well, Christopher. Well, that's, and I see that's... Alexander's question, which I'm happy to, to we, answer we as well. The, um, we, we, won't, run? Uh, we won't get to that question. Um, uh, cause we, we, we do have to announce the winners, um, okay. and have finished. So Daniela, thank you again so much for just sharing just a little tiny piece of your wisdom with us. Um, really, really helpful and really encouraging about, um, how uh, exciting this experience is, uh, as, as students think about their careers, their further learning, their next steps, and just their, um, themselves as, as, as as civic agents and, 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 and change makers. So thank you so much for joining us. And uh, now we can move on to the audience choice winners. Um, so just a, a reminder here, each of the winners of the audience choice, there's one from stream A and stream B, um, uh, receive a $250 gift certificate towards Canada Helps. Uh, to uh, to donate to a charity of your choosing. Um, so, can I get the drum roll, please? In room A, the winner is Humber College. Room B, University of Alberta. Congratulations to Humber and Nube. Okay, now for the moment you've been waiting for, 
I'm going to hand the mic over to Kelly Hodgins uh, of the McConnell Foundation, who will announce the four winning teams. Thank you, James. Okay, um, I am very excited, very honored to announce the four winners as chosen by our judges. Thank you again to our judges. Um, and before I announce those, I just really want to offer again my biggest congratulations to all of the teams. Um, each of you had really outstanding, outstanding presentations and of course your written submissions, all of that work. But um, we have four winners, um, not ranked, just four winners um, who will be going on to the global finals. And without further ado, and in no particular order, I am going to announce the first, uh, the first one, drum roll please, Amy. Amazing. And um, the first one is Wilfrid Laurier University. Congratulations, Alexa and Coleman. Amazing work. Okay. <laughs> and the next one, second, is moving on to the global final. Drum roll, please, Amy. The University of Alberta. Great job, Christopher, Kevier, Kayvon, and Kia. And third, <laughs> drum roll, please. <laughs> it is the University of British Columbia. Oh. I lost my screen. There we go. Um, so thank you. Uh, amazing. Good work to Anika, Kathy, and Emily. And finally, the last team moving on to the global finals. And again, congratulations to all teams. Drumroll Amy, University of Waterloo. So thank you, everybody, um, for all of your hard work. Congratulations to everyone. Who, who made it to the final. Um, we really wish you all the best in the next stage of that. Uh, to the four that are going on, we wish you the best in the next stage of this competition and all of us will really be cheering for you from Canada. I'm going to hand it now back to James for the final words. Yeah, thanks Kelly. Just echoing Kelly that uh, congratulations to each of the four Canadian finalists who will go on to the Global Map the System final hosted by the University of Oxford in June, and please tune in for that. Um, congratulations as well to the audience choice winners from each stream. And finally, I wanna take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank Latasha Kafro for her outstanding leadership in managing Map the System Canada, as well as Amy Rintoul for her support to this year's program, and Colson Proudfoot for helping with logistics this week. You can imagine the advanced prep and logistical complexity of running this week's series of events from the coaching sessions earlier in the week to the four concurrent semifinal sessions to the final event and the adjudication. And planning for the 2020 edition begins mere weeks from now. Uh, so thank you all for joining us and being part of Map the System Canada 2021. Stay safe, have a wonderful weekend, and see you next year. <laughs>